Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Teresa Barbist, and I'm a teaching artist here at the Perez Art Museum Miami. I'm very excited to welcome you to today's program, our live virtual local, local views at PAM. As you know, I won't be able to show you around the museum today. Instead, I will present our work from my personal practice over the last 10 years. However, before you start, before we start, and since people are still trying to join in, I want to give a big shout out to the education department at PAM, to our fearless leader, Marie Vickles, to Anita Braham, who is putting this program together, and to Andrew Bird and Denise Faxis for our tech support. The education department at the PAM has been doing incredible work to build a bridge between the museum and the community. We are touring thousands of school kids every year. We have docents who are doing fantastic tours for our visitors. We are creating events and uh, we are trying to really create these connections between the museum and the community. As you know, the museum was also very hard hit by the coronavirus and by the crisis that we are going through at the moment. But still, we believe that the museum can be a huge support for the community, especially in these really hard times. So we started to uh, teach our kids um, that usually come to the museum online through um, digital education. We created videos and we created presentations that teachers can share. So we think that we can really help out teachers, kids, and uh, give back to the community. If you are able, please consider to donate to the museum so we can continue with this programming. You are gonna find a link in the comment section. It's a pinned comment there. All right, let's get started. I would like to introduce myself just a little bit for all the folks that don't know me. I know a couple of people probably are here from the art community who've been, uh, who I've been part of for the last five years. But for the, for the people who don't know me, I'm um, originally from Austria. I was born in uh, Schwarz in the Tyrolean Alps, uh, a true Tyrolean, the daughter and granddaughter of a skiing instructor. I grew up skiing and I, I also grew up um, just, you know, being outdoors most of the time. I studied psychology. I got um, my PhD in psychology. I became a psychotherapist and worked in a hospital in Innsbruck where I was seeing um, patients with um, mental disorders. And I also had a group for um, immigrants, uh, for especially women from Turkey, actually. This group was um, a therapy group that I um, led as a psychodrama group. So we were using um, theater methods a lot to kind of get, get beyond our, the roles that they knew and kind of try out new ways of living and of dealing with difficult situations. However, 10 years ago, I took a sabbatical. I came to California to study at the Tamalpa Institute Art Therapy, and it was a movement-based art therapy program, which I've never done before. Uh, not dance and not art. So this getting into my body and this movement practice really opened up a whole different side of myself that was um, the creative side. So I started to paint, I started to draw, I started to do performances during this program. And um, a year later, I went to the San Francisco Art Institute. This is an image of my very first uh, performance that I did in a gallery at the Somats Art Gallery in San Francisco for an event called 100 Performances for the Whole. Incredible event created by Justin Hoover. There were um, performers peeing into the hole. There were performers blowing out smoke from one body part. And they're just an incredible, intense and rich experience. I was seeing the whole more as a, as a prison or as a cage, almost like a, you know, like a, like a mental prison. I was going through a lot at the time. I was dealing with symptoms of um, PTSD, especially dissociation, 
which means that emotions from past traumas come up and they are they are so strong that um, you can't really connect to the outside world anymore because you're just trying to deal with whatever past memories or feelings come up. So this hole for me was, um, was this cage where I was trying to get out and I was like moving my body around and banging against the walls and lifting myself up as you can see here. And in the end, uh, the last action that I could take was a scream. And it created kind of like a loophole, almost like connecting me to the audience, making myself heard and kind of like breaking through that cloud of, of isolation and uh, finding a way, finding a way to communicate. I, as I said, I studied at the San Francisco Art Institute, which is like this incredible institution that has been around for 150 years and now is facing very, very difficult times where we don't know if it is going to survive. For me, it was a wonderful place and it was like the perfect place to transition from, you know, being a psychologist. I was 31 years old. I was in a drawing class for the first time in my life, in a live drawing class, and I really didn't know what I got myself into. I left my job in, uh, in Austria to start this crazy journey. And I want to mention one teacher, Ana Teresa Fernandez, who was incredibly supportive. And SFI does one thing really, really well. It, it makes you figure out your own voice. It doesn't tell you what to do. The school is really supporting you and finding your own, um, your own themes, your own ways, and your own voice. For me, that was incredibly important because I had this rich background as a psychologist, as a therapist, and I just got into, you know, my, my creative expression. So this was a film that I created at SFAI. It's a 60 millimeter film that uh, I shot over three years and then edited together on this old steam back table that, uh, steam back table that is, you know, really beautiful. So let's watch a short clip. As you could see, it was really um, a, um, an attempt to connect different memories, different experiences, different emotions, and creating like a whole out of the fragmentation, out of that almost like a shattered self. In this still image, you can see that I'm touching this door, which is almost like a door that opened up, and and I was able to access. Uh, past trauma that was really stored in my body more than anywhere else. And so after that, you know, there was kind of like these floodgates open and I had to kind of scramble to figure out a new, a new identity in some way as well. And it was wonderful to also work with my colleagues from school in this video. They appear almost like ghosts. It's very like, it's very much also this feeling that we go through right now where we are like stuck in our in our apartments and our connections are are so fragile in this point right we have to make an effort to call or to um you know to connect to people and so for me that was also like this 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 attempt to really connect connect back myself my emotions my memories but also connect back to to the other people to the outside to my environment to my community um, a quick note if you have any questions right now um, please share them in the comment section below if i don't get to them right away i'll make sure to answer them at the end of the presentation Something really wonderful happened after I graduated. I got an invite from Charo Oket, uh, an artist here in, in the Miami art community. And she, she saw an image of one of my performances and said, 
listen, I would like to, uh, to, for you to come to Miami for a week to perform at the Miami International Performance Festival. And I said, yes, I'm going to do that. That's exciting. So I brought my, my sculpture, which is called Creatura or Creature, with me. It's like made out of canvas and paint and, and some twine. And it, it served me as this um, prop for the performance where I was really fighting with this creature, trying to gain control, control back over my body. And um, so it was like between, well, who has control, this creature, this object, or, or myself? And so in the end, I, I was able to, to defeat this, um, this creature and win the struggle and, um, you know, move on from, from this experience. Uh, quick gossip note on the side, I also may, met my husband um, during this performance. He was the one who took this picture um, and, you know, um, it kind of changed my life in many, many ways. In this time, um, I created this series um, in Austria. It is titled Stauben which means dying. And it was originally actually shot on a, on a crappy phone and um, an Instagram post. Uh, it was two weeks uh, before my, my mom and um, passed away. And then a week later, my grandmother also passed away. And um, for me, this series is really important, not just as a reminder of um, the fragility of the body, and also my future, I see my own future in it, but also as a, as a way to, to remember the important connections that we've made with people we lost and to hold on to those. So many people in, in this horrible crisis are going through the loss of loved ones. And I feel it's so difficult uh, to, to say goodbye when you can't be there, when you can't be present, when you, when you can't hold a person. For me, it was also, I was able to say goodbye before they passed away, but I was back in San Francisco and I was also not present. I think that creates a huge impact on a person. And I think people have to be so creative at the moment to find their own rituals to say goodbye and to find a space for their grief and to find a space to remember their loved ones the person who was hit the hardest by um my mother's passing was that um my father who was 15 years older than her was left over this is the name of the series it's called it's called Übrig leftover this was on the day of my mother's funeral and we went on this hike to kind of just get through this day and i saw him walking this this road alone you know and uh the polaroids didn't develop right they because it was so cold so now they have like this this beautiful green tone to them that are uh, that is really um that is really important for this series that set an emotional um, back, backdrop for, for him. So I got my first question here. Um, Lori was asking me where the performance was filmed. And uh, it's probably the first performance that I showed you, the In the Hole performance. And that performance was actually filmed by a TV crew. Uh, that was incredible. They had all different angles and it was like very professionally shot. And um, the second um, film where I was lying on this stone wall was actually in my back, in my, um, in my back garden where I was living in Marin. Then I have another question from Megan. How did you find the confidence to perform? Did you feel vulnerable to use your body as part of the work? To be honest, the first performance that I had to do at the Tamalpa Institute for my art therapy program, I was hoping to fall down the stairs to break my leg so I would not have to perform. That's how big my anxiety was. 
and it never really stopped like that performance in the whole being like this 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 first public performance for me it was incredible like i was i was incredibly anxious and um there was this one performer there she was um like a seasoned performer already and she said she looked at me and i was dressed in leather from bottom to top to protect myself you know from the impact basically and she said you know what if you're dressed in all leather like this you're going to be fine whatever you're going to do so i still remember her kindness and really supporting me through that really difficult and you know emotional performance that i did there and then we also have shire um my my good friend and colleague shire asking me how do you incorporate your psycho psychology background into your work and that is something that i was not aware at the beginning other than coming out of this art therapy training and dealing with of course my own content autobiographical information i was very much when i first went to school saying like i don't want anything to do with psychology anymore i want to be an artist now and then i realized i was sitting in our new genres class tony labad was there as well and Chris Solers was there as well. And it felt like a group therapy session. It really did. And I'm not, I'm not saying that in a way that is, um, you know, making fun. I thought it was just for me such a shock that I was trying to get as far away in a way from psychology and I landed in a setting where you still have to harness your own story to some degree, right? It has to come out of your own being be it like shire is working um uh she's doing portraits of uh, african-american children and grown-ups who have been uh, victims of gun violence but she was personally affected through that with her son being the same age as the first victim when that the that series started so it still has to come from the inside so now i'm very much aware of this connection between psychology and art and i feel more confident also just to say you know this is this is a personal experience that i'm dealing with i found a, a way to transform it into something beautiful into art but that's where it comes from and it definitely often comes from pain it often comes from struggle and i do believe that all all of you guys that have to go through through this traumatic event right now can also use artistic methods, creative methods to find an expression. And that doesn't have to be beautiful uh, in the, on the contrary, but just to, to find a way to deal with what's going on. So thank, th thanks everyone for the questions so far. The way that I was, a was able to deal with my own grief was through art making. I, um, I was back in San Francisco. I worked in a gallery in Fisherman's Wharf. I had to take uh, the bus from uh, Marin County where I lived to over the Golden Gate Bridge to the city every day. And this was actually a series that is called Lucky Drive Bus Stop Series. And I shot it every day when I had to drag myself to the bus stop and stand on a highway, on a highway nevertheless, to wait for my bus. I had this one moment that that was you know, creative. I didn't have a studio anymore. I didn't have time to really make a lot of art, but that moment, I had that moment. And I took a series of Instagram photographs where I'm reflecting, I'm being reflected in this bus stop, in this beautiful texture of like layers of scratches and smudges and then the background. And in some way, I think I was trying to figure out who I was after all those losses you know i i lost my maternal figures i lost my roots not just because i moved to the states but also because you know the i lost my my mother my grandmother and so i was the last woman in my line in that way right and so i was trying to figure out well who i am i now right and i was it was creating this ritual so every day i would take a look and see what is what is me right now, you know, and what is my surroundings? And it changed over time. When I moved to to Miami, I was incredibly grateful that um, two collectors from Miami Beach, Stephen and Yvette, 
bought this whole series. It's a series of more than 20 photographs. And they decided to hang it in their, in their, in their apartment, in their new apartment. And it was like, you know, for, for collectors to connect on that level, uh, that was, that was really a wonderful um, moment for me and to, to appreciate that kind of work. So Marie Vickers is asking me any advice on how folks at home can utilize art to cope during these times. I'm telling you as simple as possible is the way to go right now. What I'm doing right now, I have a, a lap loom, like a small loom. I'm doing uh, weavings every day and I'm turning them into small sculptures. It is something that I know that I've done over and over again. That's my way to cope. I'm, I'm going to show you an image, but the series is called hashtag a weaving a day keeps the shrink away. And I believe that. I honestly believe that if you can make something small, it could be a small drawing. It could be a small movement. It could be your knitting. A lot of people make masks. And even if it's utilitarian, it's also, it's also an act of making. And if you, if you use an, if you, use this energy of making that gives you a little bit of control in this really uncontrollable situation that we are in right now so that's what i would suggest but it's really anything that you have available so when i came to miami um when i moved to miami five years ago i was incredibly lucky to get a studio at the bakehouse art complex and i was so excited to go back to my studio practice after you know just trying to make a living in San Francisco. And I was creating, creating, creating. And this was a series that I showed at the Swenson Gallery. Um, Justin Long was doing a series of Swenson shots exhibitions and it was called String Games. It was a canvas that I, that I cut up and then um, bound with twine and um, painted. It's called Im Nets in the Net. But it also relates to my body. It's about the size of my body. And I almost feel like the, in the center, it's almost like a heart and you make the connections outward. I also translated the sculptures that I created into movement and did a video of that. So it was still on the wall. The sculpture is still on the wall, but I took it back into space through translating it into my body. This is a recent uh, film that I shot at the Bakehouse, um, a 60 millimeter film again. For me, it was very important in that film that I was, again, object and subject. I was behind the camera and I was in front of the camera. I did not use a cinematographer. I was the cinematographer. And it was titled um, Spieglein, Spieglein an der Wand, Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. It came from this idea of mirroring, right? So for a baby, for a child, it's incredibly important that there is a, a, a figure, a, a mother, a father, that is able to mirror their, their emotions. That's how they learn how to not just regulate their emotions, but also to figure out what emotion am I feeling right now? So for a lot of people who have experienced trauma, also for a lot of people who grew up with mothers who have experienced trauma, that's a very difficult thing. And so in this video, in this film, I was trying to create this maternal gaze. I call it maternal gaze, right? Instead of the male gaze, it was a maternal gaze where I'm looking upon myself and trying to uh, figure out what is going on, what are the emotions I'm going through and what could be coping uh, strategies. So we are gonna take a, a, a quick look at this film, a short sequence that I would like to share with you.
So as you can see, I'm, I'm facing the camera almost like a defiant child, right? There is like this staring at, in the end, myself, but staring at the other as well. But I'm also, I'm also playing the piano and uh, singing like this Spieglein, Spieglein an Anderwand in German, this mirror, mirror on the wall. So there is a lot of like different layers to this piece. I thought was what was really interesting. I, I showed this film at a local film festival and uh, it was the 305 The Story Dance Film Festival. And uh, after I showed it, um, a male visitor came and gave me some feedback and he said, oh, you're so much prettier in real life than you're in the video. And I thought, I thought to myself, you know, I think I did something right. If that is the reaction, because that is, that is the male gaze, right? That we have to be beautiful and we have to be charming and we have to be smiling. Not that that is always happening in, in, in the film industry, but I'm just saying like, you know, kind of, you know, tone, you know, kind of like um, summed up a little bit. So I did not want that, you know, I wanted to show something from, from my inside world, like something that how I feel and, uh, and also the struggle, convey the struggle through that medium. A really good question from Ellen um, Muller as well. He asked me if I think all art in some way can tap into emotionally processing hard situations. And I, I, I do believe, yes, um, all art, I do believe that art making, it doesn't matter what medium you, you choose can help you emotionally process. But then also, one of my favorite artists in the collection is Sam Gilliam. We have this beautiful work that I've been thinking about so much in quarantine of his. It's a smaller piece. It's a smaller draped painting like this. It's called Blue and Fire. And it almost looks like this cape, but there are all these emotions in it. And um, it, it could be an armor, you know, but I don't see it as an armor. I'm, I'm seeing it more like a letting you in and look, letting you into seeing all the emotions of life that life ha has to offer. And so just thinking of that artwork makes me feel better. You know, just thinking of, you know, even wrapping myself into that piece is something that gives me comfort. So it also, for some people, it's not the art making. For me, it was many, many times staring at the Rothko, at the SF MoMA, that was like church to me, you know? And for a lot of people, it is also uh, spirituality as well. You know, it is also a creative act to believe um, that gives you some, some control. So it's, it's very open, you know, it's for everyone kind of has to find their own coping strategies. Alrighty, so in the, in the recent years this is from 2018 i moved the sculptures of the wall and the canvas off the wall and i created like these internal structures for them this actually has milk crates in in it but it still creates that kind of this stability for it where you can put the skin on top of it and these um these neon strings that are kind of connecting um different layers together and one more sculpture that I would like to share is a sculpture that I made last year. And that is, that was painted on a, on a big piece of canvas and then cut up and, and stretched and connected together with um, door hinges. It also stands on door stoppers. And so it's kind of broken, almost like broken up, you know, like this um, image of like breaking open and it has these metal rods in it that could, you could see them as like stabbing wounds, right? As, as like wounds inflicted onto you by life. Sometimes I also look at them as almost like surgical rods that can stabilize um, a broken leg or a broken arm and it helps to heal. So in some way, uh, I'm still dealing with this idea of wounds and, and how do you heal? And how do you also, you know, build the, the structures to, to hold you during that time? Emily 
Patty says, um, thank you for bringing creativity and connection to quarantine. Thank you so much for saying that. I think it's so, so important. And Denise Faxas says, I appreciate your perspective relating art to spirituality. Thank you so much for that comment as well, Denise. So I wanted to show you one more um, artwork that is really from this quarantine time. And it is one of these weavings that I mentioned. I have a very hard time not to be able to go to my studio. The um, shout out to the Bakehouse Art Complex who is doing an incredible job at supporting their artists by suspending rent and by creating opportunities. But of course they had to shut down uh, to um, create social distancing and keep us safe. However, for me, it's like one of the hardest things if I can't go to the studio. So I had to create like this little studio on my, on my living room couch. And I'm just doing these small things. You know, it's not a long, that, that piece took me maybe an hour and I was, I was watching Grey's Anatomy on the side just to keep me going, you know? And um, yes, I'm, I'm that old, but um, it, it's just like this, this ritual of like the weft and the warp, you know, creating the structure. And, and creating something out of something that is so fragile and so soft that looks like it could withstand a lot, right? I'm, I'm, I'm documenting all these sculptures outside. It's like on our little laundry shed and, and I'm putting them back into nature. And I feel like one of the things that I'm appreciating a lot during this quarantine is I realize how important nature is for me and to slow down and to connect and to look at a tree and to see the movement in the leaves and to see the movement in the branches. And so I'm really grateful for that time, as hard as it is, for someone that, um, you know, being stuck at home, it really um, affects my mental health. And I can imagine how many of you also are struggling with, um, with um, you know, feeling, feeling alone or feeling depressed and feeling anxious. So this is like my little moment where I, where I feel good about myself. So we have uh, a couple of more questions here. Soledad Villamil said, thank you for sharing your work. Well, um, I have to give it right back to you and um, back to the PAM as well. Um, thank you so much for tuning in today. I know, you know, all these digital things can be incredibly overwhelming, but I appreciate every one of you who tuned in today. And of course, thank you so much to the PAM, who is giving artists, local artists now, an opportunity to shine and to share their work. And it is so important for us to survive, for the local art community uh, to survive, for you to be supportive in tuning in or in buying an art piece or donating to the relief fund if you can. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for all your questions. Oh, we have one more question. Maria Lino, good friend from the Bakers is asking me, how big are they? These woven sculptures are really, really tiny. They are probably, the size of, um, I'm not good with inches, but about this size. So they're really, really small, but I like to make them look big. You know, I like to make them look like they have uh, heaviness to them almost, and they can, they can withstand uh, the storm that we are facing right now. All right, so if we don't have any more questions, I think it's already time to, um, say goodbye. Thank you again so much. Please tune in next week for uh, the amazing Ria Leonard, who is also at the Bakehouse Art Complex, um, a studio mate of mine. She does incredible work with printmaking and also drawing. And um, yeah, thanks again. And um, I hope to see you back in the mu at the museum soon. I hope to be able to give you a tour there soon. All righty, take care, stay safe.